This is the movie guy that tries to draw and keep his intros consistent, James Cork. And with me, I have podcasting machine and planes walker extraordinaire, Norman Sanso. Crystals. It's okay, we can get you some sugar crystals for your coffee. You're going to be fine. And also, we have the man, the myth, the hippogriff, awesome new reviewer, Silver Quill. Oh, uh, look, they conquered the Crystal Empire. You know how easy that is? I did before breakfast today. Well, you went to the nearest Toys R Us and got one of those toys that they were selling for like $50 and they are like, oh, please, somebody buy this. Nobody's buying this. If they were selling it for $50, I would not buy it. They were. I remember that the Princess, Crystal Princess said, uh, wedding, whatever, costed something like 35 pounds in uh, Toys R Us in the UK. It's ridiculous. I don't want to talk about this one, but in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Siege of the Crystal Empire. That is issues 34, 35, 36, and 37 of the My Little Pony IDW comic books, written by Jeremy Whitley, with art by Andy Price, and colors by Heather Breckel. And boy, is this a mouthful. It's directly Uh related... Oh, yeah. (laughs) In more ways than than one, it's a mouthful. It's directly related to the ending of Finship is Magic issue number one, the one starring King Sombra, and follows up on the events of that one comic that was also written by Jeremy Whitley. And I think universally loved by everyone. Someone... Some loved it less than others, but it was in that area where everybody was giving it nothing lower than a four out of five. Which always surprises me with these comics. But this one follows up on the events of that comic. And my gosh, I think going to first impressions would be the best way to go. And we're also going to go thematically instead of going scene by scene or event by event. Or else we're going to be here until tomorrow. And I think we're going to be here until tomorrow anyways, because good God. So what do you guys think of this one? And um, as always, inverted alphabetical order. Silver, feel free to go first, man. Ah... Uh... Well, it's it's funny. In the interactions with the fandom, I've ended up being the defender of this comic on many, many accounts, even though I do agree with many criticisms. All of this hinges on your opinion of Radiant Hope and Sombra. They are the focus of this comic. They are the, the motivators, the changers. They have an impact on other characters, but ultimately it always comes down to them. So, why are so many other characters in this? You, It is chocked full of returning villains, returning antagonists, the main six just there because it's the My Little Pony. This suffocates under the weight of so many characters at once. And so no, there are so many ideas at play, but none of them really get to be explored because it's just overloaded. And at the end, you come out really mad at some of the characterization and frustrated by some of the missed opportunities but ultimately, I think it all comes down to a to a spacing issue. More on that when we get into the the story proper. So what you're saying is that they try to cram way too much into a too little of a space. Surprisingly, a, even a four part issue, and that'll be a question for later. Even a four part issue isn't enough to contain a variety of character motives and uh, arcs that are present but not explored in this story. I absolutely agree with with you on that one. We're definitely gonna touch touch one touch on that one when we get to it. But what about you, Norman? What do you think of it? I thought this comic was going to be the bomb, as they say. Like this was so amazing. This was so exciting. It was like the return of the king. Haha. <laughs> but in the end, it was just mediocre. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. It was all shiny and chrome, but it was just mediocre. I don't know how to feel. Stop it with the Mad Max references, I swear to God. <laughs> you are one from me to send you to the gates of Valhalla. Oh, shiny and chrome. No, but seriously, um, I do like the story. I do like where it's taking it. But there's a lot of problems with calling back a lot of all the previous villains. I, I think we we'll, we save that for when we get to the meat of the show. But yeah, l- let's save it. In my case... I went into this one not listening to any of the criticisms because I waited until all of the issues were out so I could read in one single sitting. And I didn't want to listen to what people were saying. They were like, oh, this is worse than the Wild West arc. This is worse than the Everfree Forest arc. This is terrible. This is the worst thing that IDW has put together. I was like, no, I don't think they can go that low. And if you want my, my, my review on that one, it's not as bad as those two, okay? It's not as bad as those two. But uh, they have 
probably the best first three issues that I have seen uh, this comic put together. And that includes the Reflections arc. Like, I love the first three issues of this one. It's so good. Uh, they are so uh, enthralling. The characters are there. It feels like it flows very well. The stakes are so high. And I am actually on Silver's boat on this one. I really like the way that uh, Radiant Hope and Sombra are characterized. I like them. And I also really like the Umbrum. I was so into this one. And in one issue, in the last fourth issue, they destroy all of that. It's the most disastrously put together comic book I have read in my life. Everything they built up, no payoff. So to the people, I was actually getting upset reading the comment section on Equestria Daily when this comic came out. And they were all acting like the comic murdered their entire family and then set their house on fire. The amount of hatred that there is on that comment section is legendary. But I am going to give them this. If they hate the uh, arc based on the last comic, I'm ju that's justified. I'm okay with that. I, I, I back them up. They are right. I I hate the comic as well, just based on that last issue because it's it's sloppy, it's so crummy, it's really bad. So yeah, we're gonna let's talk about that one because uh, about this one, not not the last issue, issue in particular, but let's talk about this comic. So since we are going through themes, what should we tackle first? Let's start with the the least of them all, the League of Not Quite Evil, but not very light, nice either. Oh, the, the the league of we're going to build these guys up and we're not going to finish their character arcs. <laughs> Any of them. The main six outside of Twilight really aren't consequential to this story. They are there, but they have less of a role. And they have less of a decision to be made. But the league, and I do call them that because it's it's just a unique combination. They had a role at the beginning but after the first issue, they basically should have stayed locked in those cages. Put simply, Radiant Hope gathers Lightning Dust, the Flim Flam Brothers, and Iron Will, all of whom have a grudge match against one of the main six. Do they? Well, Iron Will feels he's not being respected as a as a Minotaur. No one no one's coming to his seminars now. Because Fluttershy's sensitivity training has basically robbed him of any street cred. But here's the thing that bothers me with Iron Will, like I mean specifically because he specifically went to Fluttershy to do the, well, quote-unquote sensitivity training because he was having trouble with his family. Shouldn't he be happy and hold no grudge towards Fluttershy for this? Because it says you're desperate to find a foil for Fluttershy. It's completely out of character what Iron Will is doing. Not even in the episode that premiered him, they portrayed him as a... Uh... He's not evil. He's just doing his job. I've always defended the villain in that episode was Fluttershy, not Iron Will. Having him as part of the League of Evil is like having Peppa Pig as part of the Suicide Squad. <laughs> it makes no sense. What? Porky Pig on the su Suicide Squad. That I would like to see. Oh, God. Take that, Superman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I said I said Peppa Pig, not Porky Pig. But yeah, Porky is the same thing. A, you see what I mean there? It's like it's unjustified you don't need that the insertion of iron will here i do not agree and even with the flim flam brothers like didn't they like since when did they had any trouble conning people out of well yeah since when do they have any trouble well in all honesty i don't think any of the the league really fits this role I feel like Lightning Dust and the Changelings and Chrysalis, they do fit the role, especially the Changelings, because ever since they escaped at the end of Finship is Magic issue number five, I wonder what are they going to do with them? Yeah, I do agree with that, because for me, Lightning Dust does hold a huge grudge on Rainbow Dash. Is it warranted? No, but her characteristic does seem to lean more on that end, where she is just petty. Queen Chrysalis, the most evil of them all, I do agree. She does hold a huge grudge and wants to prove a point. Yeah, the most well, evil of them all, but yet she's the one that, that is the most caring and smarter. No, no, she's just smart. The changelings, no question that they'd want to conquer. They, they're acting under the assumption that they'll have a, a smorgasbord of emotion. However, Lightning Dust's sole goal is to get back at Rainbow Dash. How does that escalate into, I want to help conquer an empire? Flim and Flam have had have a lacking of moral fiber in their diet. But again, they want a con job 
treason is very bad for business. Just like Iron Will wants to be a motivational speaker, not doing nine to f- nine to life in <laughs> Equestria Prison. Oh yeah, want to put that in your resume? Oh yeah, and try to throw th- throw down an entire empire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would have made sense if these guys had been duped. They thought they were just pranky in the main six, and things escalated far beyond what they wanted. But there is that scene where Sombra frees them, and. Although they look badass, uh, glaring down at the main sex and being all threatening. Suddenly, they're not even taking after their grudges. Lightning Dust takes down Fluttershy. Iron Will goes after Applejack. Flim and Flam take down Pinkie Pie. Suddenly, th- that, that pretty much removes any accountability or, well, I was just doing this to get back at X. They're actively helping overthrow the Crystal Empire. Well, it could be a situation where Radiant Hope told them specifically to target specific ponies to take down. It could be that. No, 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 I don't think so. Considering this comic and considering anything MLP related, uh, when you have these characters that are targeting specific characters, it would make sense that Iron Will goes for Fluttershy, that Lightning Dash goes for Rainbow Dash, the Flim Flam Brothers go for Applejack, and the changelings go for Twilight. Like, I'm so happy that Rarity doesn't have a foil because she's friends with everybody. And I'm like, uh, thinking about it, I don't know if Rarity has a real uh, nemesis. Like, Sorry, what, are we going to bring in... Su- I was going to say that. <laughs> They're going to bring Suri Polomer and then what, wrap her up on one of those sequins uh, outfits that she was going to make but she didn't? Or maybe bring in Trender Hoof? Trender Hoof, like, nah, 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 stupid. That would be stupid. And the way that they handle this, I think it's also really sloppy. They, they, they just, they, they don't put the character with the one that is, uh, that, it, that they are meant to be fighting against. Because it's clear that each one of them is a foil. But they are not going after the ones that are supposed to be their respective foils. Even from the first issue, where Flim and Flam smuggled changelings into the Crystal Empire, I could say, oh, Radiant Hope probably just gave them a box and said, just get this in. But no, they look so happy when the changelings are unleashed. They know what they're doing. Flim and Flam doing what they did in this comic, out of the four villains, I, I do not agree with Iron Will and the Flim Flams. Like, their place in this league of evil pony villains does not work. Like, the, the logic in Leap you have to go through does not work. And even with that, their interaction or their presence in the comic falls flat in book three. It ends in book three. Uh-huh. That's the yeah. other thing. That and they they're from the end of the arc, where it's time for the Resistance to jump into the fray. These ponies that helped end Minotaur that made things go wrong are nowhere. They have vanished. Here they are. They've voiced that they are not comfortable with the situation, that they've they've made a mistake and this has gone too far. And then they bail without ever rectifying their mistakes. So there's no reason for them to not to be treated as criminals. They should be spending the rest of their lives on the run. Odds yes. are they'll be in, instantly forgiven at some point, but because that's how these <clears throat> comics tend to go. But not, not only that, but also from a narrative point of view, uh, uh, this is so... Crappy, the way that they do that is like, I feel for poor Lightning Dust. This is the second time they shaft her character without giving her some sort of redemption or closure on her character arc. You remember in Wonderbolts Academy when they just kick her out of the curb and they push her out of the academy to, like, you know, they remove her from being a lead pony, not even giving her the chance to be a, a wing pony, right? Yeah. In yeah. this one, they do the same. I know that it's very easy for us to sit here and go, oh, we're going to criticize this, and we're just going to complain about this without giving a solution. I am going to tell you how you can write a much better conclusion to this comic. It's very easy. On that part of the comic where a, 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 a cannon fires out of nowhere, and one of the Umbron gets shot in the stomach with a cannonball, then have a panel where you see one party cannon then two party cannons, and then another big panel where it reveals that it's Iron Will holding both party cannons going, Iron Will is going to teach you how to miss with Iron Will. And then you have the League of Evil actually turning around and helping the rest of the main six 
to take back the empire that they help throw down. Okay, they don't make that doesn't make them good guys, but at least it compensates. It breaks even. I do agree with that point of view, and I do wish they went there, except for Chrysalis because she's unredeemable. Well, but Ch- Chrysalis still. was smart. She left on the third issue. And she act- and that is actually very in character. She's like, I don't care about any of you. And then she leaves. She's like, good, good. That's that's good. True. I, I do agree with the point of view where if the quote-unquote League of Evil helped to uh, undo what they did, okay, smart move because, well, uh, probably you'll get a pardon by the princess for helping yeah. thwart the evil plan of King Sombra. Probably. Actually, actually I will go further than that. Chrysalis does something more than all the other guys on that League of Evil because she takes Twilight out of the cage. At least, even if she's laughing at that, at, that's, at least that's better because, I, and to be honest, Chrysalis is the one that came off the best out of all the, that group of useless characters because she's the one that goes after Sombra thing, uh, saying, what do you mean the Ombrom? The Ombrom are going to consume everything and they're going to leave no love. How am I going to feed my changelings if I have no love to give them? Horrible buck pony creature thing. You are some somehow you have become the most relatable character in this entire comic. Oh my god! I can't believe that I am somewhat rooting for this character that is supposed to be one of the villains. Because she knows what she wants. She has a clear uh, goal. Yeah, her agenda is clear. She goes through it effectively, unlike the other characters who really don't have any any purpose or motivation. See, I mean, here we are. We are only talking about the secondary characters, and already I can sense the anger. Feed me your rage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated because I really wanted to like this comic. For once, it felt like they were doing something out of the box. That they were taking risks. That they were uh, pushing, pushing the, pushing the envelope and saying, "Okay, we're gonna do something that is absolutely insane." We're gonna bring back all the villains and we're gonna take down this part of the com- of the of the world that nobody gives a crap about. Because seriously, who cares about the Crystal Empire at this point? Well, they were they, they were doing some gutsy moves, but the ending to this story was kind of a cop out. Since we're talking about villains and all that, we should talk about the ones that the villains are meant to uh, bring back and the ones that bring the villains uh, together. Let's talk about Radiant Hope and King Sombra. Oh yeah, let's do, let's do, because there's nothing more we can say about the rest. Yeah, and we cannot move any further without talking about the, <laughs> now allegedly considered in the fandom as the Mary Sue of the comics. I have seen so many people call Radiant Hope a, an absolute insufferable Mary Sue, and I so don't agree. But let, let, let's, let's talk about them. What, what do you guys think of uh, Radiant Hope and Sombra? I'm actually quite a fan. Oh, I yeah. like these. I, li- I like these characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so do I. I like them as well. All right, so let me break it down for you. In this culture, everyone is complacent with destiny. It is the determining factor. It is uh, the guideline we saw in Magical Mystery Cure that even when you're not happy with it, you accept it. If you're not happy with the destiny you've been given, well, obviously, you don't really understand what that destiny is. The problem is on you, no one else. Now, here comes Radiant Hope, who has lost everything. She lost her home, her friend, her future. And there's that one panel in her flashback in the second issue where Celestia is happily teaching in the background, completely oblivious to Radiant Hope's uh, depressed expression. And I thought, that's it right there. That's the flaw in a culture reliant on destiny. Celestia can't, for the life of her, understand what is driving Radiant Hope. She has the destiny to be a princess. And for Radiant Hope, that's not enough. So she takes account of her future. She goes out to try and understand it. Unfortunately, she is naive and uh, prone to manipulation. So she takes the wrong path. The Umbrum, my God, the Umbrum could not have chosen a better and more manipulative form to coerce her. Yes, when she's the weakest, there, there is nothing that can convince you better to to uh, join their side than something so cute and adorable looking as the Umbrum. Because let's face it, in this in this form, they look absolutely adorable. 
Like I want, I want many of them. Can I take them home with me? <laughs> They're uh, a symbol of her childhood of better days. They, and in some ways, they've been. There's a hint in the early part of the flashback that they've been sort of crafting her since the since she was a foal to be this manipulative uh, target. They're promising her a, a chance to reclaim better days. How could she not fall for that? I mean, when people say, oh, she's so dumb for falling for that, I think what they're really saying is, oh, I wouldn't have been taken in. But when people say, oh, why didn't she trust the princess as well? The last time she did, they lost her home, banished her friend. Not much help there. Well, why why does she care about the crystal ponies? You mean the ponies that shunned her for years and basically drove her friend to become a villain? She's wrong, but she's wrong for understandable reasons. And I think that's where this thing falls apart. People really aren't feeling sympathetic towards her because we know how this show works. We know the main six are right. We know the Umbrum will turn out to be awful. Well, to be honest, I didn't know that. <laughs> Same here. I, I, I'm I gonna say the twist halfway through this issue where they reveal the Umbrum and okay, I was already kind of like seeing it coming because if you know a little bit of Spanish, you know that any character named Rabia, that's not a good sign. <laughs> oh, that's not a good sign. What does he mean? What does he mean? Uh, rage. <laughs> Ravia, Ooh. Ravia is rage. <laughs> oh yeah, I love Ooh. the fact that the name, the name of the Umbrum, uh, following on this in the same uh, method as the name with Sombra, because Sombra is shadow in Spanish. They have Spanish names, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> oh this is bad. And turns out, oh, <laughs> uh, this is the, oh no no no, this is this isn't good. Uh, this isn't good. It's uh, about, I I I like that. Uh, that twist really didn't see it coming. Um, but no, what you say about Radiant Hope, Silver, you're absolutely correct. Uh, she also she doesn't follow on her destiny, which is something that many people misunderstand when it comes to the, Mary, the uh, accusing her of being a Mary Sue. I don't agree. When people say, "Oh, she's just a Mary Sue," no, she's not. She's definitely not. You have to understand the place where she's coming from. Like you said, she lost everything. When you are in such a mo in such a situation where you are at the rope's end, and the rope itself is on fire. You are like, where do I go? You become desperate, and you find comfort on the most unexpected of places. It is pretty understandable why she did what she did. So yeah, I agree with you, and I really like Radiant Hope. I think she's one of the best, best, most interesting written characters of uh, of uh, that the comics have given us. But she's only half of this discussion, because we should talk about the person she's doing, the pony she's doing this for. We should talk about Sombra. Who was so terrifying when he made his reappearance. When he was just formless smoke or whatever. Just this pillar like, of rage. Like, whoa! Andy Price really rocked it with this uh, with this comic. Like, you, you, you remember how critical I was of him with the, the good, the bad, and the ponies and uh, the Revenge of the Everfree? Uh -huh. The root of the problem? Yeah, I take it back. Absolutely. I think he was he was saving all of his talent for this one because the the visuals in this comic are all beautiful. And the way that he both the Umbrum and the way that King Sombra is drawn from the very beginning of the comic to the very end. I love it. Absolutely adore it. Just for that Andy Price deserves an award. This is stunning. And especially the Umbrum after they've revealed themselves, which where's your cute little fair, fairies now? <laughs> oh, they did, uh, They pulled the Guillermo del Toro on me. Ah, oh, the cute little crit critters turn out to be terrifying. He it's like the that. South Park Christmas special. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. Let's talk about Sombra because they write him differently than the way that they write him in this. In the the, the way that they write him in the show. For a starter, he says more than three words. And he has personality. <laughs> Yes, he he's not just crystal pony slaves. He's 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 more than that. What did you guys think about the characterization of Sombra in in these issues? I've been dominating. So uh, Norman, what did you think? I like how they put a personality, they put a characteristic in him, and the way that it carries over from the first friendship is magic was pretty interesting. Like okay, we get to see how powerful he is when he's battling the two sisters, which got turned into stone, mind you, and how useless they are to, when faced with 
such powers. So King Sombra here is just pretty interesting. And they give him the dilemma of, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to do this? This doesn't feel right. I, I feel that this is wrong. But he comes to that point where he might change. But Twilight just, they done goofed. And he's, okay, on pure instinct says, you know what? Open the door, let chaos loose, and let they be shadow. Hmm. I enjoyed Sombra as well. It, it, he's a guy who's he's convinced himself he's a monster. I mean, he's trying to commit to that, but deep down he's actually afraid of himself. He's actually a little fearful of what if I'm the monster and the other Umbrum really are just victims? What if I'm proving everyone who doubted me right? But that's the thing about destiny, isn't it? You're not bound by it because Radiant Hope did say an interesting fact which got me thinking and got me to say like, ah, oh, this is interesting. Her destiny was to become a princess, but look at her now, she's not. So, what does that mean? You can change destiny. You can do it. You don't have to be the evil king that you see who you are. You can change. Quite honestly, I think these two characters prove that destiny in the world of Equestria is a fallacy or a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because uh, Sombra did his best to become the king of the monsters and take over the Crystal Empire, release the Umbrum, and basically take over the world. Of course. Uh, and he did that for like a day. When it comes to successes, he is almost as successful as a Starscream in the Transformers. He managed to take over the Empire long enough to enslave the ponies, but then he got taken down. And Radiant Hope also was destined to be a princess, and she she didn't. She didn't become a princess. So neither of these characters really followed on their destiny. Sombra almost got close to that, and in this comic also gets close to that, but they really don't follow through with it. So <laughs> maybe maybe it only works with main characters. <laughs> in truth, destiny is a term we use far too liberally. We always say destiny if it's something we want. In fiction or in, in mythology, destiny is an absolute. You can't cheat it. There's a, a great story about a man. He sees death in the marketplace, waving, beckoning towards him. So he, he runs to his master and says, I have seen death. He's coming for me. Grant me, a, a, grant me passage to Morocco so I can outrun him. The dude says, sure. So the guy gets to Morocco and he sees death sitting there waiting for him. It's like, what? why did you beckon to me? And the dad said, I was just surprised to see you in the marketplace. I knew we we were destined to meet here in Morocco. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, would you call that kind of like the Cassandra's complex? Like knowing something and trying your best not to, to, to prevent it from happening. You only cause that for it to happen. It is. And, and in some ways, the crystal, I still maintain the Crystal Heart set all this in motion by making Sombra afraid he'd become a monster. It basically set Sombra on this path because the whole reason he ran away into the Umbrum is because the Crystal Heart showed him that future. Who knows what he could have done to avert disaster otherwise, but it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And in a culture that is so passive about saying, this is my destiny and destiny is wonderful. No, destiny in a lot of classical fiction is one of the cruelest things you can ever reveal to a person. Because more often than not, destiny is you're going to suffer, you're going to die, the rest of the world will may benefit from your death, but your destiny is nothing anyone else would want. And I guess it's made me realize, My Little Pony, it's taking destiny, but it's really saying entitlement. You deserve this great future where you're more important, where you're loved and celebrated, where you're a princess, or popular, or powerful. And really, the world does not owe you anything. You know, the term destiny nowadays has changed a lot since when I was younger. When I remember playing games or watching shows, the way that they used destiny was kind of not the same in terms of the destiny of this person is to do this. If I do remember right, the villain who always used the word destiny, like, it is my destiny to rule over you all. And the hero of this show says, no, it's not true. And I'm gonna prove it. And what you blah, say, blah, blah, blah. What, what you, what you were saying before, Silver, you're absolutely right. And, uh, I take back the way that I was using the word destiny back then. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. It's not so much about destiny, but what about the person wants. 
Uh, what about the character ones? Besides, yeah, I agree. The, the idea of destiny is something that you are not in control of. That is really mean and pr- pretty much heartless. It is true. What these two characters saw in the Crystal Heart is not what they were meant to do, but they, what they wanted. Maybe what they wanted to become. Although I think with, in the case of Sombra, he had less of a choice. Because the Omron revealed that he was built for that purpose. That they put him together for that, uh, for uh, the only purpose of bringing them out of their confinement. That is also an example of this with the character of Sunset Shimmer. She too wanted to saw herself as a princess, as an alicorn, seeing taking over everything and in control of all that. When she took the decisions and made the motions to achieve that goal, a lot of bad things happened. And it wasn't until she started acting on a different way that she ended up getting what she wanted, but not in the way that she was expecting it to, to be. I re- I'm referring to the ending of Friendship Games for that one. So it's like, I agree with you. I don't think it's Destiny moving these two characters. I think it's it's just what they might think is right. And they're the only two that have really resisted Destiny or or faced the idea of choice rather than leaving it up to fate. There's no magical MacGuffin meant to support them, though they do restore the crystal heart. <laughs> Speaking of magical MacGuffin, can we talk about the ending? I think we should talk about how this ends, but we should talk about the writing on a separate uh, on a separate topic. But let's talk about how they bring Sombra back together. All four princesses are like, oh, I'll do what Twilight says. Yeah, I like t- Sombra's gesture of putting the crystal heart back in its place. But what the princesses do in that part is absolutely ridiculous and uncalled for. And out of character as well. I know I don't, I said before that I don't like the sentence out of character, but in this case, this makes no sense. Why are Celestia and Luna helping Twilight restore the guy that turned them into stone? Ah, oh, this is oh. so stupid. They basically are saying, oh, we instantly forgive you. I think there's something to be said for ponies and mercy. They tend to be very free with giving mercy. But <sighs> there comes a point where it's like, now we're getting into after-school special levels of kindness. <laughs> and this is an after-school special level of kindness. It's like, uh, uh, may I suggest an alternate way this could have ended? The same way that I suggested an alternate way they could have brought and redeemed the, the League of Evil. How so? Well, very easy. On uh, In the page where Sombra is fading away, he disappeared and everything, and Hope is like, no, I'm not letting you go! And she tries to get him back. They they should have had Twilight at that point saying, saying, yes, just going to her and putting a hoof on her shoulder and going, no, stop it, don't, don't do this. It's his choice. He did the right choice. Let him have this. And have Sombra disappear completely. Bookend that. This, get rid of Sombra altogether. And... That's it. There you go. I have no idea. It could have been a happy ending. Could have been a happy and actually somewhat mature way to end the comic and not talk down on the kids that are reading it, if you have kids reading these comics. But assuming that it's more your your older audience reading these comic books, the part where they bring Sombra back into life and they rebuild him, and they put reflections in the background. It's like <laughs> very hammer, very very hammer there, very subtle. Well done. You, you saw that, right? Did you cut that? Oh yes, I do like that they didn't try to have Celestia. She knows the Sombra she fell in love with is nothing like the Sombra in front of him. But even with that, it makes no sense because this was brought up by by someone on a, on, a, on the EQD comment section that I actually very much agree with what they said. They said. If this good Sombra is supposed to be the opposite of evil Sombra in that other, alt- other alternate universe, how come Celestia and Luna are not evil in this one? Mostly I think the, the rules for reflections kind of went out the window. You have two good royal siblings, one forced bad Sombra, and at the time, one blown up Sombra. Now you've got a good Sombra and a, who chose good, and a Sombra who was forced to be evil, it's all a mess. It's an absolute mess. Trying to make heads or tails of this is like trying to make heads or tails of the entire Marvel Universe going all the way back to the original comics. It's like, you can. It crumbles. 
Although the original, the, the Marvel Universe took like what 200 issues before it stopped, it stopped making sense. This one started going out the window after issue number 47. Oy. Oh my gosh! And even with that, and even with that criticism, I'm so happy for this too. I hate this part, but I like it at the same time. I'm conflicted about it. <laughs> that they go, they go off to rescue Princess Amore after her thousand years. You know what? I want to see their adventures together. I want to see what's gonna happen with these guys. I hate it. I think it makes no sense. But I don't know. I think I like I like the way that they portray Sombra on this one, and I like that they don't like fully get rid of him. That they can use him on another issue if they choose. Yeah, if such things happen, <laughs> who knows? What would you guys make of that ending? The the whole let's let's retransform it Sombra and let's rebuild him. I'm fine with the redemption because it's kind of funny. Gilda has been redeemed. Trixie has been redeemed. Discord's the only male character to have been redeemed. All the others have been blown up or physically restrained. And I don't know if it really comes down to gender politics, but it's a funny trend. Giving him another shot, this comic does capitalize on the momentum from Sombra's fiendship is magic, which is the question I want to bring up now. If there have been issues showing Iron Will, the Flim Flam Brothers, Lightning Dust building themselves up to their frustrations. Would this have made more sense? Would this comic have benefited from even more build-up, giving others a chance to shine? No, I don't think so, because if they ended it the way they ended this one, you still have the issue of not giving the the unredeeming League of Evil uh, a redemption at the end of the arc. Like, bringing up the Pony Billions... In a rather slapsticky and messy battle that we're going to get to when we talk about the writing, uh, instead of doing that, if they had given the guys that that redemption, yeah, I would have liked to see more comics based on all those other characters. But then again, you end up turning the five week event of Pinship is Magic into a into a ten issue long collection like the micro comics. So you have the Finship is Magic Flim Flam Brothers or the Finship is Magic Lightning Dust. But like the same, the finality of their story. And in them getting shafted to the side as a side joke, then, yeah, to be perfectly honest, no, I don't think I would have liked to have seen those comics. I would have been even more disappointed. Having talked about our villains, what about our protagonists, especially Twilight and Cadence? Because I'll say this right now. The main six, Applejack, Rarity, Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie, Fluttershy, they weren't needed. They had no specific role in this. And even, I really don't like how Shining Armor and Spike... Spike disappears. <laughs> Spike is nowhere to be seen. Shiny armor, he is not even shown to be depetrified at the end. It just shows how little they matter to the story. And really, the, the main five are only there to provide the slapstick battle at the end. Twilight is interesting because she was sympathetic to Sombra at the end of Fiendship is Magic. She was like, oh, she rather wrongly said all, all he wanted to do was see the Crystal Fair. Well, no, that's not all he wanted, but... She was sort of sympathetic. Here, after seeing him turn her mentor and friend to stone and abusing all her friends, she's livid. And in her anger, she makes a mistake. And that that's a theme when we talk about the writing, the theme of anger in this, in this comic. But Twilight's emotions get the better of her. Her anger causes her to make so many mistakes. Cadence, this was the one time, <laughs> this is the first time Cadence has ever had a pony say no to her. And I actually admired how she handled herself. She she engaged hope in discussion, played along, revealed the Umbrum's deception, and then was pretty much just back to being a perfect princess. But for a brief moment, there was that one scene where she's able to close the, the stairwell. Yes. yes, 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 yes. I love that scene. That was great. Now, at first, at first they were talking about how, well, you have to have ra- true rage. Do you have a headache, princess? And at first I thought, wow, she could never open it before because she never had any rage. And now that she's had a moment of rage, it's gone. God, the perfect princess continues. But then I thought, no. What if Twilight has a headache because she had to muster lesser anger and it was a real strain? But Cadence has some rage in her heart that she's just never been willing to admit. That panel where Cadence is like, no, I feel fine. That is... And she's somewhat shaken. That is the the biggest um, character development that the character has had in three years. It's the only character development she's had. Yeah. And and even though it's not perfect, god damn it, I'm taking it. 
because it's so cool. That, that was a good moment. It's like, wow, even this perfect pony princess is able to put some rage into her. But the question there is, is she going to build on that? Are we going to touch on this again? You know that we're not. You know that we're not. The next issue we're going to see her on, we're going to be seeing her dealing with her baby. And she's going to be a perfect mother. And she's going to leave the baby with Twilight. And Twilight is going to be a messy aunt. Because they don't want to use Cadence anymore. Makes me sad. Well, who knows? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. If that's what I fear will happen. But I don't want to decide for the show. Make assumptions. It's just disappointing that they introduced this idea and it doesn't get fully explored. Cadence Is Cadence going to come away from this saying, Shining, I think there's a part of myself I've never really admitted. Oh, I should really depetrify you before we have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, and, and that's the policy on hoofball matches from now on. Are you okay with that, dear? <laughs> your lack of uh, the reaction makes me say that you're saying yes. <laughs> I guess Kane should feel jealous. Uh, someone else made her husband hard. <laughs> Rock hard. <laughs> but anyway, like you say, their instant forgiveness. Oh, you just saved my empire after you condemned it. You just think, my goodness. It's after school special. It's PSA. This is almost a public service announcement. It's, and that's, that's, I think that is the biggest weakness of the entire comic. The writing. Let's talk about the writing. Well, the writing. I mean, it starts off well enough with some mystery. You want to know Radiant Hope's motives. Actually, you know, there are two themes in this. I, I mentioned anger. Anger drives so many characters. It drives the League of Not Quite Evil who want payback because they're angry about where they've wound up in life. The Umbrum are angry over their imprisonment. Sombra's angry at his treatment. Twilight's angry at seeing her mentor and friends abused. And all that anger does is hurt more people. It's only until you, Sombra lets go of his anger, only until there's an act of kindness that things start to be uh, positive. So I think that theme does shine through. Anger just begets more anger. And the only way to break the cycle is some act of forgiveness. So in the way, maybe the after-school special does serve a purpose. It's just not very... Could we have more than a panel? More than two pages, please. Yeah. A bit better build-up to it. Not such a sudden conclusion. Even with that, I'd say that some after-school specials, they do deal with rather heavy issues. Why don't they just end it with Sombra just disappearing? But, you know, it's not so much that the writing is sloppy, but they misspell Siege. At the beginning of the first uh, of the fourth issue, uh. it's, it's not siege. It's not sage. It's siege, and the constant non-pony words. Okay, you know how My Little Pony has its own lingo, where they will say no pony, every pony, Phyllis and gentle calls, and all that. In the first issue, Rarity is making references to her as if she she has hands. It's like, oh, sorry, Pinky dear, my hand slipped. To me, that was like, oh, that. Totally pulled me out of the out of the experience. It's a nitpick, I know, but there are there are uh, instances of that throughout the entire arc. And I don't know if this is a problem with the, the way Jeremy Wildy writes or something, but it felt like it was a bit careless. I never really get hung up on them because I've they've said hands in the show before. They've said people. They've had human mannerisms slip in because the writers are human, and it's kind of hard to put yourself in the mindset of a horse. What are these fingers? <laughs> what do I do with them? Ah. These horrible, horrible appendixes. <laughs> There's one other theme in this that isn't shining through as clearly, but I think it's important. And I've been thinking about this a lot because it ties into not just My Little Pony, but I recently read that the two fictional characters that are being held up as role models for little for young women are Katniss Everdeen and Arya Stark. Oh no! Yeah. What the hell are you? Where did you read this? Uh, I think it was in Rolling Stone. I'm doing my best not to swear like a truck driver right now. What the hell? Well, here's the thing. Here's where I think it all comes together. The theme of pain. Pain is one of two things. It can be a connector. You feel bad for Arya because she's going through all this, all this awful events, and she's sort of powerless against this war-torn world. You feel bad in some ways for Katniss, who is also at the mercy of the world and goes through a lot of terrible events. First Hunger Games, I was all rooting for her all the way. Radiant Hope, 
she connected with Sombra out over a, a shared sense of rejection. We can be alone together. And they formed a friendship around that. And we, as the audience, feel bad for her, at least at first, based on the pain of what she's gone through. I had the headcanon that maybe she could have become Twilight's ancestor. So much for that idea. But then the fault comes in, in all three cases, where pain is meant to be an isolator, where people believe, very often, my pain makes me special. It makes me stand out more than any other. It elevates me above someone else. Katniss is this tragic figure, and no one else in the world can share her pain. And, oh, everyone stands in awe of her because of that pain. Baloney. Arya, she's so pain-driven that she's becoming murderous and violent. Well, yeah, that's a that's a role model for little girls, sure. Radiant Hope is so fixated on her pain, and she's concerned for Sombra, but we never get to see her looking and regretting what she's done to the rest of the Empire. She sees her petrified teacher and Princess Luna, and she's talking about how no one's left there to stop us. She looks a little regretful, but we never get to see her just whisper, I'm sorry, or something like that. Something to say... I know what I'm doing is wrong. I wish it didn't have to be this way. And because of that, the audience turns themselves off to her. When you use pain as an isolator, the audience is isolated as well. Any empathy or understanding dries up. It is why that's the failing. You couldn't have put it more simple. Uh, But then again, Arya Stark and Katniss Everdeen as... Role models. models. Oh, God, that is so wrong. I could talk about how Katniss is such a, a, a sociopath for like a week and not be done with how much of a sociopath she is. Like, no, no disrespect to Jennifer Lawrence or anything. She's a sweetheart. But the writing of those books that permeates into the scripts is just terrible. And But what do you mean with this? Is that, are you saying that Radiant Hope might be a bad role model for those that read these comics? I think she needs another phase of her development where she starts to empathize with others Even when she was trying to get Sombra to not petrify Twilight and company, I think that was her just trying to keep Sombra from being the bad guy, not really worrying about, I don't want anyone else to suffer more than they already have. So basically, no more unnecessary deaths is what I'm saying. No more pain. No more corruption for my friend Sombra. I do wonder if Jeremy Whitley was working off of his first draft and they decided to go with that. And nobody gave him feedback or told him to rewrite it. But I don't know what happened. Something must have happened because Whitley is not a bad writer. I can neither confirm nor deny what's been going on. Mostly because I have no clue. But there's I I have no idea either. But my gosh, would I love to be the fly on the wall in that discussion. We needed a few scenes of Radiant Hope looking and taking stock of what she's done. Even if she did say, I have to keep going. Again, making the wrong choice, but understandable why but we never got that unfortunately it, it is really unfortunate to be honest i can feel like we are dwindling on the discussion of this comic and that's because maybe maybe it, it is something thematic to do with it even the way that you are wording the criticism and the criticism and everything silver is like you sound more disappointed than than, than angry and i have seen you angry remember the the the, the wild west arc discussion oh, that was anger that... filled with anger review Oh, that was that was the low point. This <laughs> this cannot compare in terms of disappointment and frustration. The Wild West arc, anyone yeah, who says this is worse the Wild West, I will argue very, very strongly against them. Yeah, so would I. Like, this is not as bad. Okay, it's not as good as uh, as other arcs. You know what? That would be a great a great idea to talk about. Where would you rate this arc when compared to the others? Let's see here. It's hard to rank it in terms of individual issues because some stories are just one-offs or two-parters. In relation to four-parters, the best four-parter still remains The Return of Queen Crystals. It was standalone. It had strong and weak moments, but it was there. Then there's Reflections. I think that really gets a bum rap, but I actually enjoy a lot of elements within it. Again, none of these are what I would call perfect, but they're there. I would actually put this ahead of The Return of Nightmare Moon because it fleshes out characters rather than undermines them. And I think the Nightmare Rarity arc did undermine the concept of Nightmare Moon. I'm sure people will disagree with me on that, but that's where I stand. I absolutely agree, actually. I am with you. I think that the the Nightmare Rarity arc was a bit uh, watered down. Like, I wouldn't wouldn't put it on the the, not even on the top ten of the comic arcs out there, actually. 
But yeah, I am of the same opinion. Four parters, Return of Queen Chrysalis is awesome, followed by by reflections, then this then the Siege of the Crystal Empire and finally the Nightmare Rarity one. I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Your reasons to uh to hate and dislike are very similar to mine. Uh, and I thought I was gonna put reflections on top of the like number one. But when it comes to solidity and like you said what you said what there was was key. It's self contained. Like it happens, it it happens between itself. It doesn't continue after or before. I think that is the weakness of reflections. It leaves way too many doors open. That's how I will put them as well. Now, if we are talking about other arcs, including yeah. two parters, I think we're trying to the, avoid the order this will arc, be to- oh, so- oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They will be totally different. But it's definitely not as bad as the the Wild West arc or the Root of the Problem arc. Those decimated characters, I know and enjoy. It destroyed genres, it insulted the audience, it created characters that were just foils and nothing but cardboard cutouts, and wasted a lot of potentially good elements. This one did as well, but I think those did a lot more damage. Norman, what about you? I don't know, I'm trying to remember all of them, like all the four parters, because looking... One one problem I have here is the Comixology app does not arrange their comics books well there's a huge gap in numbering. So trying to remember all of them is hard, but going by memory is like, I do feel that the return of Queen Chrysalis is number one because of how it flows, how everything goes. It's done pretty well. Number two would be reflections. I do like the story, even though if people have a lot of problems with it, I didn't. And uh, let's see, number three, I'll say this one, uh, the Siege of the Crystal Empire. It had a lot of development for certain characters and I enjoy it a bit more than uh what you might call this uh nightmare rarity. That one was just fun but I felt it was a bit off at some places, especially the moon creatures, those things. Like they came out of nowhere. We are agreeing three part agreement on this one. This is a first. What else am I missing again? Cowboy was it? Well those those No you said all of them you said all the four parters. Oh, really, no? Yeah. Yeah. There have actually yeah. been very few four-parters in this series, which is funny. Yeah, only four. When you talk about the arcs, especially four-parters, they have a curve that you have to follow. Like, the Siege of the Crystal Empire did it well, where it was kind of a build-up. Part two was going up. Part three hit its peak, where, oh my god, what are they going to do next? Number four was the disappointment, unfortunately, but what can you do? You know, we haven't talked about the hijinks battle. Or the fact that Crystal Empire had to outsource its rebellion. <laughs> That's the thing that gets me. How lame are you when your own citizenry can't fight your battle? That's something that I don't understand. It's like, where are all the other Crystal Ponies? This Crystal Empire feels surprisingly barren and empty. What there's is the population? Worth sieging, that there's nothing yeah. worth sieging. That there is nothing worth taking over. It feels like the, uh, in, in every episode that features the Crystal Empire, there is always some crystal ponies walking about, even even when the hell, when they came back from a thousand years banishment, there were crystal ponies hanging out in the restaurants. They were uh, walking around on the streets and all that. The place felt like it was alive, even if it was so pristine and clean. It felt like there was population. That's perhaps the problem with this comic. Is like, besides Radiant Hope... Did you see any other crystal ponies around? Well, there was that one crystal guard. Just one. There are crystal ponies at the beginning when the assault begins, but then they all go off screen. And Flash Sentry was nowhere to be found. Oh, come on. Don't bring him up, man. Like, don't bring him up. No, no, no. It will make sense. On this one, it will make sense. The way I look at this comic, or the way that the comic is written, is to be clean, knit, and jam-packed. So if you do insert, well, I'm not sure whose fault is this. It could be Andy's or it could be Jeremy. But to me, it all depends on how you present it. And the way that it's presented is to be, okay, we need to focus on certain characters. So let's not clutter everything with background characters like the ponies or Flash or whatever it is. Because when we see each scene, when we see each panel, it has something to do with the stars of the show or characters that matter. 
like you mentioned, with Shining, he was just there to be there and turn to stone. We don't even see a resolution of him being unstoned. I, I'm just joking about Flash. I kind of, I just laugh that even when he has a chance to be there, he's not. Now, I mean, I do love Flash. Like he's an awesome guy. <laughs> you say that now, Norman, while people are pulling, are kicking down your door with the pitchforks and the torches. <laughs> Hey, he may be a waifu stealer, but he gave me an opportunity to snuggle up with Sunset Shimmer. So I'm happy with that. But my point is, the way that the comic is written here is to go scene by scene where certain things are not needed. If this was written in by Jeremy to say to Andy that, okay, we don't need this, so let's just uh, focus on what's important, the characters. Or if it's done by Andy without uh, Jeremy saying so, that means... He took the reins on, okay, I believe that this is important and background characters are important. It's one of those things that we don't know what's going on. So as the finished product, we see, oh, this is rather barren. I wonder what happened to all those crystal ponies. I do agree with Silver that we do need the crystal ponies defending their own land. Why do we need outsiders to help? I do believe that the rebellion comes from home. Yeah, I kind of dropped the ball there. Hijinks battle. Yeah, let's talk hijinks because the Umbrum were terrifying. They looked oh, scary. Yes. Yes. And they're defeated with glittery capes, apple launching yeah. cannons, party favors, and their counterattacks are turning lassos into snakes. Okay, kind of scary. A big umbrella. What? And a U shaped really? Tunnel. It's like, no, you're joining the hijinks. No. Or, a, or, a, or a mosquito, a mosquito, uh, swatter, a fly swatter, giant fly swatter is like, punk. What the hell? This is so silly. This is something that the changelings will do, for example. Because the changelings could open themselves for hijinks while still looking creepy. This is really stupid. This is like seeing Pyramid Head breaking into a song and dance in the middle of, of a Silent Hill game. You don't do that. I'd actually like to see that. <laughs> oh yeah, so would I. I think that this is thematic with the whole scene because we, personally for us, we got the Umbras are scary. We do see that they have shadowy figures that they are scary. They are scary. They are creepy. But we got no idea how they are actually. We know they're scary. We don't have much info about how they should act unless I'm missing a point where this are quote-unquote real mythological creatures. As far as I know, there are not. Really? Well, huh. okay, not real mythological creatures. That's oxymoron, but... Yeah, because I've heard of Ombras before. Like, I played Bayonetta, and they used the name there, too. Let's do a quick uh, search. If I... Blades and Beasts wiki, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> okay. So, to me, when I see the Umbras fighting for the first time, like, not much info is given, so, eh, it's rather believable. Lame, yes. The way they interact with the threat, yeah, believable. I don't think it's believable. I think it's stupid. <laughs> I, I know. I could, I could see so many other different ways in which this could go around. It is stupid, yes. But how do you deal with the CMCs without killing them off? Fight back with their own... Canon, I guess. And Silver, how's the search? Well, let's see here. According to Wikipedia, it must be must be uh, true. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Uh, there's Umbra, the World of Darkness realms in the role playing game World of Darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, in mythology, it refers to the shades of the dead. Oh, Umbra is Latin for shadow. Let's see here. It's also Queen Umbra is the main antagonist in Child of Light. Umbra is a sword with multiple characters in the Elder Scrolls series. Umbra, a sphere-like creature in Warhammer 40k. Umbra witches in Bayonetta. So it's a term often associated with darkness. Well, it is literally shadow, so... Does it say anything about uh, Edgy Hedgehog carrying a gun around? No, thankfully no. Oh, okay. That's just shadow. <laughs> uh, no, but still, the Umbras in this comic underutilize. Very yeah, angry. severely so. Like I said before, visually stunning, but when it comes to the impact they make in the story, they are rather inconsequential, which is a shame, really. They look so cool. Even when they look cute, they look somewhat like between cute and creepy and until they, they go downright terrifying. That universe that they were in, that was, what's the word I'm looking for? Creepy at best because 
it's in between, oh, this is beautiful, but I am creeped out. Basically, everyone was trembling at the mention of them. Even the changelings run for cover. But the minutes they're on the scene, they're gone the next few pages. Truthfully, you could have ended the Siege of the Crystal Empire with the ponies losing and started a whole new four-parter. That would have been refreshing, actually. That would have been refreshing. True. But the format usually for how four-parters work is usually they have a four-parter, a two-parter, a four-parter, two-parter, four-parter. But in the first issue, like the first few issues, it was four-parter, four-parter. But still, we do still have Sombra running around freely without being punished. So one day, if Temptation of the Dark Side tempts seem to open up the gate again, we'll have more story. Ha <laughs> ha. Or someone else. I don't know. Ah, yes. You're opening yourself to disappointment, my friend. Oh, I know. I know. But here's the thing. It's an option. There's always an option. People, fan fictions and whatnot, there's an option. But anyway, you look at it. The Umbrum, here today, gone, same day. Uh, Yeah. Sad, really. I mean, if they just written out the lead of evil, just inserted Chrysalis by herself, that'll be enough. That'll be awesome. Note how much we've talked about. We've talked about four secondary antagonists, two antagonists but who are meant to be sympathetic, two protagonists, a bunch of other supportive characters. This thing is jam-packed full of full of ponies and other creatures. Yeah. It's, it's too crowd. much. It's yeah, too much. It's, do you think – we'll just say it suffers from Star Wars prequel syndrome where it's way too busy, it's way too crammed with things, and it doesn't really have one focus. I'd go with that. Yeah. Besides, when you look at it, isn't, isn't Radiant Hope like Queen Amidala and Sombra looks Anakin Skywalker? And the, Sombra didn't kill any children. Uh, no, no, no. You don't say children. You say junglings. I, I, I say nuts to you. <laughs> I say midi-chlorians to you. I say Kylo Ren. Oh, shut up. That guy was such a wuss. He'll improve. Uh... <laughs> No, but we're not talking about the movie review. Uh, still well, need to be finished not? editing. Because we still have this one to deal with. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. What, what, what more can be said? I, I still hold that this comic shows that some continuity can actually help increase anticipation. And because of that, I think it's worth the idea of asking, could these comics set more up, like self-contained stories that ripple forward? I say yes, because we had the Queen Chrysalis arc in The Friendship is Magic, where she escapes, and now she's in this comic, and now she's escaped again. So there's a potential for her to appear again. The Friendship is Magic book is still there. I'm not sure if it's closed, but it's still there for future development, because, well, we do have a few other characters or villains that we need to flush out. There's still Discord, quote-unquote, who is, could be a villain, like, I don't know, but for him to explain his backstory would be interesting. And we also have a few other villains, like if they were to add in uh, Shining... Was the Glimmer like the pony in the... Starlight Glimmer? Yeah, Starlight Glimmer. If they were to put her story or even Lightning Dust, that would be interesting. We, We want to know more of them. I remember distinctively that they were going to make the backstory of Discord in the in the comics and the uh, and Hasbro told them no don't do that because we're going to do it on the TV show so i'm still here hoping that in season 6 we because i thought that the what about discord episode that we did last week i thought that was going to be discord's uh, backstory until i read the synopsis and i was like oh no it's the it's not this one hmm i wonder when it will come yeah but here's the thing do you still count discord as a villain uh i count him i count him as uh as a redeemed villain. Yeah, but still not a villain. Because the books for, uh, what you want to call this, The Finship is Magic, are villains. Like, Sombra was a villain before this one. Oh, they were going to include him on that on that uh, collection. And they told them not to. So that, that's why they went with the Sirens instead of... Oh, Discord. God. Uh, the we Sirens all remember, thought... Uh, we all remember sirens. how all that turned out. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you know what? We did completely forget about Discord. In this Discord and his small appearance at the end. Uh, Discord is just forgettable. Oh god. Discord, I think it's, it makes a lot of sense the way that he interacts in this one issue, actually. 
Like, why would he care with the matters of these ponies? He is beyond comprehension. True, but come on. If Fluttershy asks you nicely and you don't really want to do it, like, what's the point? I'm going to jump ship for a bit. This reminds me of a cameo done in one of the recent Digimons. They call back a character from the previous show called Digimon Tamers. And in the Japanese dub, one of the Digimon is voiced by the voice actress who did Goku. And in that episode, that character did not speak at all. And in my mind, I was going, they couldn't pay her to say a line or two. In this one, you wanted to just insert this quote just because... Which Digimon was this? Uh, this was the latest one. I don't think it had an English dub yet. Uh, I think it's Digimon Cross Worlds, Cross Zone, something like that. Ah, Cross Savers or something like that. Something like that. It was one of the newer ones. The, something like that. Really new. From kids that just don't appreciate these things anymore. Oh, yeah. Er, there's kids today. Er, er. All respect. Uh-huh. <laughs> er. All right. But, but back on the pony thing. Discord, he's there. People were actually asking in the forums, you know, what, now that Discord's friends with everyone, why is anything a problem? You've got a chaos spirit on your side. And, uh, give or take, chaos spirits are not meant to be reliable. I don't think you can lean on them to solve your problem. True, Dad. Never bet all your chips on a god. But maybe the ultimate thing here is that the comics seem to shine when they're character-driven arcs. And while Lauren Faust said she wanted this to be, to have more adventures in My Little Pony, I think the show and the comics work better as slice of life stuff. I agree. I do feel that way too. But when Lauren proposed that idea, I think she was trying to buck the trend of how girl show are always, oh, we need to have slice of life episodes. Oh, they're much fun. Yeah, girly girl stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh no, Papyrus, what are you doing here? <laughs> if you think about that, the slice of life episodes on the TV show, they are fine, but they are actually very enjoyable, but when it comes to adventure, the TV show is a lot more dynamic and it flows a lot better than some of the some of the comic books, and even some of the most engaging adventure arcs in the comics are actually quite toned down. We were talking about the reflections arc. The reflections arc could go on for forever, and it will never give um, deliver satisfying answers to all the many questions that it sets. However, when you put a slice of life situations and you have, again, Big Macintosh going after a box of nails, you suddenly turn a rather uneventful situation in a very epic adventure. I think most of the outcome or most of how the story ends in the comics are kind of watered down with how it ends. You have great adventures, but the outcome feels meh. I hope the writers are looking back on this stuff and saying, okay, what's working, what's not? What's receiving fan praise? What's selling well? What's what's working? Where do our comics really thrive? I wouldn't say that adventure stories are bad. I do enjoy them. Like, just looking through the comic issues here, like the pirate arc, that's fun. Like, there's a lot of adventures in that one. Uh, it's two-parter, but still, was much fun. But either way, as... I think we've really said all we can say about this year comic. I agree. I think we are nearing exhaustion at this point. There is nothing left to talk about, really. Well, let's see here. Uh, anything left unexplored? Well, really, it is a question. Do they want to carry anything forward? There's the idea that Cadence has rage. That underneath it all, that perfect pink exterior, there's still something angry. And she has reason to be angry. Orphan with a very real lack of knowledge of her past, abducted on her wedding day or or beforehand, high amounts of trauma and danger, and yet she always seems to just shrug it off as, oh, that was fun. Uh, she has issues. She has issues. She's too want, much of an adrenaline junkie. And I want her to address those issues. Be an adrenaline junkie. Something. What about Sombra and Hope? They could start an adventure of looking for the One Piece. Peace. Oh, wait. And they could have their own show with a rap opening. Yo, yo, ya, yo. <laughs> what have I done? Dreaming. Don't give it up, Sombra. Dreaming. Don't give it up. Oh. <laughs> uh, what have I done? You have no idea what you've done, man. Well, I guess I just have to believe it. Ugh, don't believe it. <laughs> Kill the non-believer. <laughs> uh, Shine the non-believer. 
But still, what I'm saying is that there's many possibilities coming out of this comic that they can explore. Cadence's rage issues, Sombra and Hope's adventures throughout Equestria to find the legendary One Piece. And what else? Oh, um, Chrysalis. It's Chrysalis Steel on the run. So yay, we have that. Bug on the run, bug on the run. Yeah. <laughs> Don't quit your day job, man. Don't quit your day job. Uh, oh, uh, so, this is his day job. <laughs> <laughs> this is my one day job. <laughs> oh. oh well. But yeah, I think this is the this is as much as we can talk about this one. Or else we're gonna run into into a wall sooner or later. Oh no, gonna, we're gonna I'm just gonna repeat ourselves. Here. We're just gonna repeat ourselves. Okay, so that's for this one episode. Uh that's for this one comic. What do we talk about next week? That's the when that's the question. I have no idea what we could talk about because when it comes to the main series uh, of comics, we are all covered. We have four episodes left of uh, the MLP show. Do we have any Friends Forever comic that we have left to talk about? We have oh, a couple, yes. right? We have, yeah, a couple. We, have a couple. we have a couple. We have a couple. We have a couple. Shall we talk about uh, do it like this? Uh, this uh, in this occasion, uh, like combine one episode of the TV show and then one comic. Well, I don't know. I, I do like it, but I feel that we should kind of clear our plate of the series. Oh, get rid of all the episodes that we have left. Yeah, like clear the series, then we can focus on the comics. And then, if we got nothing, we can always do other stories, games, or whatever there's available out there. Oh, in that case, we can talk about episode 23 of season 5, The Who Feels and McCalls. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, the the one written by Joanna Lewis and Christine Sonko. Yeah, the this we can talk about that one episode. Yeah, that'll be fun, that'll be fun. Oh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I agree. Now I just wish we didn't uh, review Ponyville Civil War. <laughs> they'll fit well. Ponyville Civil War. Yeah, they'll fit Way well. more satisfying and less murderers than Marvel Civil War. <laughs> uh, not, not according to the Marvel vs. World movie world. <laughs> we'll see how the movie world handles that abysmal. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I actually, uh, this has nothing to do with the comic we were talking about. We're not do- talking about the comic <laughs> anymore. We're talking about this. But very briefly, uh, there was a, I think it was a San Diego Comic Con panel, and they asked them, they said, what, uh, how are you guys going to adapt the comic, or how much of the comic is going to be on the movie? And the, re- the answer was, nothing. We are just taking the title. We are not adapting that comic into the big screen. Because even they know that that comic was a mistake. And they know that if they want to adapt it properly, they need the characters of Norman Osborn, Professor Xavier, and the Fantastic Four to be an integral part of the story, as well as the X-Men. You cannot talk about Civil War without bringing in Wolverine. And also Daredevil, who are big parts of the uh, story. And also She-Hulk. Don't forget She-Hulk. Yeah, that's right. Or talk about Speedball as well. They they know they cannot adapt that comic. So they are just using the subtitle because it sounds cool. Wait, wait, wait. They can bring in She-Hulk. I don't know how, but... I, f- I forget how. I don't know her origin. Very easy. It's the same origin as the female orcs in World of Warcraft. You need a sexy female version of every burly, big brrr, guy. Uh, no, not really. Uh... Of, in in comics, she had a blood transfusion with David Banner, her cousin. So yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. we can continue this discussion. <laughs> we're yeah. Not about this. yeah, we're done. We're done with the Sombra comic thingy. Like that was well, fun. That was fun. We we haven't given our final thoughts, however. We didn't give in our final thoughts. That's right. Let's let's give our final thoughts and call it a day. Alrighty. So my final thoughts on this, I don't resent this as much as a lot of other fans seem to. I still find Radiant Hope a fascinating character. She and Sombra are the only ponies who have ever had to react to real tragedy in their lives. At least, overwhelming tragedy. Applejack lost her parents, but that's always assumed. It's never addressed. These two show polar reactions. One became bitter, violent, and angry. The other became desperate for something to believe in and made mistakes. I find that very interesting. I understand that you don't really like these characters, but I think it's a mistake to say that they're bad characters. The story 
collapsed under its own cast weight. All four princesses, all the main six, four supporting villains, Return of the Changelings, the Umbrum, the Crystal Empire, too much. You tried for too much, and so nothing really got focus. And I don't mind the redemption, but I again, My Little Pony seems to be synonymous with rushed uh, redemptions. That's what it all boils down to. A good idea is there's the... There's the foundation and the work for a really great story, but it needed to cut away some of the some of the pork. As for me, uh, let's see. I like the comic. It's beautiful. It's drawn well. The story writing is iffy at some parts, and the characteristics of most of the characters are there. But you add in too much. It's like food delicious food, but you add in too many things where it's a plethora of many good things, but I'm confused at what to focus on. So that's not good. Would you say I have a plethora of characters? <laughs> yes, yes. But overall, it was okay. Not the best, but okay. I will say I don't agree with every with anyone on the comment section on Equestria Daily when it comes to talking about the other three issues. But when it comes to the fourth one, yeah. I I think that the way they worded their concern was way too mean. This comes from the guy that lost his goddamn mind with the root of the problem, but you have the right to demand good entertainment. You have the right to demand good good things for your money. Especially when you don't have enough of it and you want to spend it on buying something that you think is going to be satisfying their frustration i completely understand and share in some parts and i think that yes it's not the worst multi-parter issue that we had it's okay that will be my verdict it's okay all right i will mention before next week we're going to talk about the whole field versus the McCults. and well what's for after that well stick around for that episode well, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys had fun recording it as much as uh, and you guys enjoyed uh, listening to it. So we'll see you all on the next one. Thank you so much for listening to us. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to do this. So uh, thank you so much for being there. This has been James Cork. And I am Norman Senzo. And I'm going to go liberate, conquer, re-liberate, and conquer again the Crystal Empire, because that's really all it's good for. It's it's too far away for you, man. You might as well just go do that in Washington. It's better. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I'll leave that to the election year. <laughs> oh, no. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. See you all next time. Have a good one. See ya. Adios. The somber tone of the review goes away. Always.